Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome to this Australian Water School webinar brought to you by IceWarm. This webinar series engages leading thinkers in the water sector globally. And today, it's no exception. This is our kickoff webinar for 2020, and it's going to be led by Dr. Marcus Barber from CSIRO, a discussion on understanding water values in Australia. My name's Trevor Piller. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at IceWarm and the Chair of the Australian Water School webinars. There's a list of upcoming webinars and courses there you can see on the screen. Uh, I won't go through each one, but every month it keeps happening. Go to our website, log in, register. We'd love to have you join us. It'd be fantastic. Who's here? Look at that. Crowded in Australia, as we would have expected for this topic, but plenty of people across the other continents as well. Thank you for joining us right across the world. There's a large number of people. Dr. Marcus Barber from CSIRO. Welcome. Marcus is an environmental anth anthropologist with CSIRO Land and Water. 20 years field research experience. For those of you outside the country, CSIRO, Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation, our premier research group. Marcus has 20 years field research experience with water and Aboriginal Australians, focusing on coastal and freshwater values, rights and interests across Western Australia, Northern Territory and Queensland. So you can see there's a lot of experience going in here. My main question is, what drives you to this? Thank you very much for the question. Um, look, it's an interesting journey, actually. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but I actually started out life training in marine, bio marine biology and marine ecology. Mm. But very interested in um, the relationship between people and the sea. And then there just happened to be a project in Aboriginal Australia going at the time I was looking for a PhD. So I, 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 it was one of those um, things where you decide on a particular path in life and then something comes along that, that shapes that and determines that. That's the short version. You appear to be the right person at the right time, that's for sure. But we won't go any more with the intro, but we'll get straight into this. Terrific. Thank you very much, Trevor. Leave it with you. Thank you very much to everybody um, for their time today. It's terrific to be here. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of um, Ab Aboriginal Australia and Torres Strait Islanders across Australia. It's been a really amazing journey to be involved with communities across particularly Northern Australia. And I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging. I'm not going to linger too long on one particular example today. I will be talking about several examples and using those examples to try to expand on some of the things that, that I've learned and that hopefully will help others in their engagements with um, Indigenous Australians. And as uh, Trevor indicated, the talk today is called Understanding Water Values in Indigenous Australia. Just a bit of framing information. Actually, we do have a pretty well-informed audience. Um, but for those overseas that may not be aware of the level of diversity in Australia pre-colonially, this map is a, a map of Aboriginal languages um, from the Aboriginal and Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. It shows some of the diversity across Australia. There's actually a lot more underneath that. You can also see the scale um, relative to the US in the top corner. It's important for people to have this in mind and then also to have in mind a, a sense of the, the historical experience of colonisation that was different in different parts of Australia. So Europeans arrived in the southeast and worked their way northwards and westwards and arrived in some parts of Australia relatively late in, in, in the middle part of the 20th century in the most extreme examples. And so Aboriginal Australians were not only hugely diverse um, prior to European um, arrival, but also had very different experiences in some, time, in some places after that time. And that's an important context for some of the things that we'll be talking about today. I'll be trying to keep to actually quite a broad scale in some of the comments that I make here, and that's in the hopes of um, giving people some broader architecture for the kinds of engagements that they might have with Aboriginal Australians, or if they're an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, Australian themselves, some of the ways in which um, their lives may, may be different from those um, that I've encountered elsewhere. Where's the research that informs what I'm going to be talking about today been undertaken? Well, it is in Northern Australia. I'm based in Brisbane these days, actually from Melbourne originally. Um, and it encompasses a sweep from the Pilbara in the west to um, Cape York in the east. Um, and covers an area I was added, actually added up recently, of about 700,000 square, square kilometres. And you can see that that's a significant part of northern Australia, but it's also um, a lot less than the whole. And so that's a really important um, understanding to have as well. 
For those internationally and also for those in Australia, I'll note the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, which is a very significant river system in southeastern Australia that actually drives a lot of conversations about water management in Australia, and that includes, um, in some cases, Indigenous water management. I've had some peripheral involvement there, but the majority of this is, is actually informed by um, um, engagements in northern Australia. The first place I'd like to take you today is, um, I, I, I talked with Trevor about um, formerly being a marine biologist, and you'll see where the link is here, is Blue Mud Bay in a remote part of the Northern Territory in the north of Australia. I was able to spend a significant amount of time here um, a number of years ago and maintain um, ongoing engagements. The primary basis of the original engagement was actually, you could characterise it as coastal flows and coastal ownership. Effectively, the people from this part of Australia were looking to have their territorial claims recognised and be able to regulate non-Indigenous commercial fishing activity which was occurring in the area. The Australian National University and the Northern Land Council, um, which was the Indigenous representative body, came together in a partnership that I became involved in and it was to, to effectively launch a test case regarding coastal and sea rights. What I'm going to do today is talk about some of that material with a view to um, highlighting the way that water is built into, can be built into Indigenous understandings of territoriality and ownership. And that provides a path for, for thinking about um, how water uh, and Indigenous people are related in their respective countries across Australia. In talking about this example, what I'd really encourage people to think about is the sophistication of that relationship no, and it's not the specifics of the relationship that you should ex extrapolate across Australia. The diversity that I showed earlier is very important. It's the fact that that sophistication existed everywhere in different forms. I'm going to start quite simply though, and um, to describe, if you like, a system of hydrology that people are highly sensitised to in that environment. And um, it starts quite simply with rain on the hills in coastal Blue Mud Bay that flows down into coastal floodplains. And I should acknowledge here that that's uh, Jumbawa Marawili and Gumbania Marawili, two of my brothers who were instrumental in um, educating me about a whole range of things, but not least this. That water flows through the coastal floodplains and out into the coastal bays of Blue Mud Bay. And the, it may not reproduce particularly well in this photograph, but you can actually see the water is brown um, from, from a river sediment fading to green into the horizon. And people talk about how um, the, the water has land in it and the land has water in it. There's a continuity there. That water is then understood to flow out to the horizon where it forms up as, as clouds. And um, indigenous people in this area, when they're asked about where their country stops or, or where their ownership boundary is, they'll point to where the clouds stand and say, that's where we own till. And that's not an amber claim to the horizon. It's actually because the, the clouds are an integral part of the system that I've just described. And they're named, they're, they're sung, they're related to sea currents, and they're understood to then move water back onto land in that cycle. So this, this kind of hydrological sensibility, um, if you like, and meteorological sensibility, informs, is quite elaborated. Um, here you can see a satellite image of, the, of that area and, and juxtaposed with that is um, a, an artwork from um, Jamboa, who was in the previous photograph. And if you track from that, uh, that artwork from bottom to top, it actually reflects um, the transition from land to sea. The, the central narrow figure is um, the lightning snake that represents the, the connection between salt and freshwater. The bottom panel in the, in the painting is the, the freshwater environment. Moving through um, uh, images of um, of mud crabs and fish in the coastal um, seas. And then finally, to the cloud and the seagulls on the horizon. And when I first saw that image, I, I really thought the clouds don't particularly look like that. But of course they, oops, apologies. Of course they do, if you look at the previous image. That was one of the reasons I took that photograph that day. So this is an important way in which people constitute their, their, their sense of themselves and their country in this environment. And it informs a highly detailed um, ownership system of both land and sea. This is from um, two colleagues of mine, um, Howard Mo and Francis Morphy, who Howard was actually my supervisor for this research. 
And the, the detail of this map isn't important. What it's really shown in the sense that the, the pattern is what's important, which is um, a whole set of clans in the area, family-based clans, and that the country is actually quite carefully divided up and into particular areas, but also that there are ancestral creatures that are journeying across this landscape. So it's a really complex way of, of understanding people and country as interrelated. And it is it uses water as part of the basis for that organisation. In this particular work, we undertook some some resource use surveys um, of how people use country. This is actually a twelve months worth of usage in this environment, and you can see how it maps onto some of the ways in which um, the key water sites are and and how they're used. I won't go into detail on this today. I could talk at length about this topic, but um, we need to move on. Just wanted to highlight the subsistence use here, the, 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 the fact that people were using the coastal environment and particularly the aquatic resources available. So this integration of land, sea and, si and sky in what, what in anthropological terms would be called the Yongu people's coastal cosmology is partly constituted by and through the circulation of water. It's a crucial way in which they think about themselves and their, and their relationship to their land. The research that we undertook on this topic was influential in the court case that was always planned. And ultimately that court case was successful in the High Court of Australia. It set a precedent for intertidal rights across 80% of the NT coastline. And actually it's been quite a struggle for um, governments and society to deal with the consequences of that case as a result that the negotiation of a settlement of the outcomes of that case is still ongoing. The underlying goal of, of the work that the Yongu undertook for, to, to achieve this result was both recognition of their ongoing ownership but also in some ways reversing um, the colonial process of, of, of the way in which their country had been reconstituted um, without their knowledge initially and then without their agreement after that point. I'm going to talk about another example from the Northern Territory that sort of highlights the way that Aboriginal people have, have interacted with landscapes over time. This is in the northern part of the Northern Territory also. This is the Roper River in the Northern Territory. It, um, it's a distinctive part of Australia, um, really remarkable for its beauty, but also for its cultural significance. The significance in, of, of the one I wanted to talk about today was that the Roper River actually is, has an area, and you can see this on the map, Mark, Mark Red Lilla Lagoon, that is um, where there, it's quite um, flat and the river braids into separate channels. So it actually separates into smaller complexes of, um, of, of small rivulets. There's very good continuity of Aboriginal occupation in this area. People weren't forcibly removed as they were in some other parts of Australia. But what did happen was they were absorbed into the cattle industry. This area of Australia is also very high profile for the non-Aboriginal po population. Generations of people read a book called We of the Never Never when they were at school. And uh, this is the area that, in which that book um, took part, that set, that was set. In that book is actually a reference to an Aboriginal water management practice. And that's really the highlight of what I wanted to talk about here. Um, it refers to how um, Aboriginal people um, using a relatively simple technologies of logs and sheets of bark were able to dam the, um, or at least slow down the water flow in those braided sections of the river. In doing so, they created lagoons, which then created um, resources for themselves. And this is a, a photograph from 1911 of Red Lily Lagoon, which was one of the key places in which this occurred. Um, Walter Baldwin Spencer took this photograph. Effectively, the Indigenous water management practices here extended the existence of wetland habitats or indeed created them in, in circumstances where they wouldn't have otherwise existed in that form. As, as um, Gunn in her book notes, they were a larder. They had a role in ecological management and had obviously would have had a wider set of effects on, on animals and plants surrounding the immediate area. There is, if you wanted to draw a long bowl, a bow, a potential for long-term role in geomorphological processes such as soil deposition and erosion. This practice has played out um, over an extended period of time. Now, what happened in the colonial era was, of course, that, that, um, that um, pastoral interests moved into the area 
Indigenous people across Australia were pushed out of riverine and pastoral areas, and this this was no different. In this sense, they were absorbed into the industry. But and cattle movements themselves were obviously driven by the availability of water. Northern Australia has a highly variable wet and dry season, and there are times of year where permanent water is immensely valuable. This is a recollection from a traditional owner in the area that about the fact that they started to use this practice in order in, in ways that enabled them to improve cattle returns. Effectively, they were stopping the cattle from getting bogged in, in, um, in, in bad sections of the river and enabling water in places where the cattle could drink. This practice, which clearly would have had its origins in Aboriginal pastoral workers, was effectively um, extended by the management of the then rope of, uh, of the then um, LC station. They extended it and in that, in a sense, raised the profile of it to the point where downstream pastoralists began to express concerns. The interesting part of this story is that LC station then began asserting the traditional basis of this activity. Remember, this is 1937. So we find an unusual situation where a white pastoralist is talking about blacks water rights, indigenous water rights in 1937, and interviewing traditional owners at the time, um, elders about why they do it. And I'll just note the last comment here where in, in quite simple English that was spoken in cattle country at the time, he says all about boy, long time, damn red lily to catch fish. What he means is everyone in the area has been doing this for a very long time to catch fish. Delcy then went to seek uh, a permit for the activity under the then water law in the area and, and, got, and gained those permits. But downstream complaints, state surveillance and state interventions continued. I should note that this story was effectively hidden and the research, what I'm presenting here is research that reconstructed this story. The case had been, the, the, the situation had been forgotten in certain kinds of records and it's about riparian rights. This is a, a photograph from the police museum highlighting the police removing the weir after it was determined that at a certain point the permit was, was not valid. They then, police also intervened, made sketches of the area in 1945 when again the issue arose. Um, you can see the weir in the sketch there if you look closely. In 1946, it finally came to a head with a court case. And uh, this, this court case is recollected locally as, as, as police involvement, um, elders nearly going to jail, and the fact that there was a, there was, there was a case. Um, LC Station prepared, and I, I'm, forgive me if I'm pushing through the text here, you don't need to read them. LC, LC Station prepared um, information about this and effectively understood it as a traditional rights case. This is a letter from the um, LC station owner, Thonaman, noting that this is a time, time immemorial practice and that, they, it should, that this claim should not be invalidated just because it's now being used in the cattle era. era. However, during the case in 45, this legal argument shifted to, from ancient rights to converting it to a question of pastoral law. In other words, were, what we, impacts were the weirs having downstream and were the permits valid? There was a, an extended court case about this issue and it generated a whole lot of interesting discussion. But effectively the outcome was, and this is where my point about colonisation emerges, the judge in the case found that the permit was invalid, that Elsie Station was liable for the downstream cattle losses and he banned the practice. So basically prevented um, anyone from doing it again in those locations. Interestingly, though, he also noted that this was, in fact, an old fellow blackfellow custom, or to put it in legal terms, had been in existence from time immemorial. What we have here is an example of how Aboriginal water practices were um, subsumed within the colonial process, were absorbed by the colonial process, and then at times converted, suppressed, or otherwise altered by that process. And this is a process that we can think about going on all over Australia in, in, in terms of impacts on Aboriginal water, ab people's presence around and near water and or their management practices of it. However, there is also resistance and the hidden history in this circumstance is that Aboriginal people kept on doing it. They kept on um, um, using this practice in other locations in the area until the 1970s. This is a, a white pastoralist recollecting how it happened in his, earlier in his life. 
they revived the, the practice lapsed in the 1980s, but it was revived again for a new purpose um, in 2010, um, and that showed actually that the um, that people were always considering ways in which it could be used differently. Now, in this case, it was for erosion control. There was a, there was real concerns about changes in the system in that environment. And what we can determine from this is that um, the recognition of Indigenous rights and interests in this area is something that um, requires quite complex thinking about. Um, the National Water Initiative, um, a key piece of legislation in Australia, asks, um, asks um, jurisdictions to think through what are the Indigenous rights, values and interests um, and the cultural needs of Aboriginal people. There has been historically a presumption in water planning going back decades that um, looking after the environment was sufficient to address Aboriginal interests. There are advocates for a cultural water allocation in water planning in Australia. That's hard to define and can be even harder to quantify in terms of a numerical water flow. What the Roper case demonstrates is effectively a, a use that is both traditional and consumptive using even the most conservative understanding of that tradition. And it, it highlights the potential for there to be an ongoing traditional rights to block or hold fresh water in certain contexts. Now, it hasn't necessarily manifested that way as yet, but it's an example of how Indigenous water management and Indigenous water interests can be quite complex in a whole range of circumstances. And to talk about it, uh, take it even a step further, it's also the potent, there's the potential here to think about how if this practice was used over an extended period of time, what kind of impacts it might have had on the landscape as a whole. Um, this area is renowned for its black soil plains and there may be um, a question about whether Aboriginal management practices have partly contributed to the nature of the local environment in, the, in, this, in this way. This is quite well understood in terms of, for example, fire management, but it is less thought about in terms of water management. Moving on, so in effect, the first of these examples was to talk about the ways in which um, Aboriginal Australians' relationships to water can be immensely sophisticated in ownership terms. The second example was really highlighting um, the ways in which the colonisation process shaped and influenced um, what we as uh, collectively, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, see today. The third example I wanted to talk about was um, development at scale. And I'm conscious that there may well be some people who, um, are, for each of these examples, are quite familiar with them. This is work that I undertook several years ago um, in the Pilbara, in the iron ore mining region part of Australia, um, and at the, um, in partnership with and with the assistance of Rio Tinto Iron Ore. So I'd like to acknowledge their, their role here. I, we may have some Rio people on the call. In this part of Australia, I'm just going to ve note very briefly the potential sophistication of um, Aboriginal interests in this area. That um, there was a an investigation, there was some research done in the 1970s that highlighted the the correlation between the ways in which traditional shields in the area and the and and were designed and the ways in which the the catchments actually were shaped. So it was in a sense. Um, of positing a relationship between uh, large-scale land and waterscape formations and the ways in which Aboriginal identities in the area were constituted. This is a part of Australia that has extraordinary cultural richness um, and particularly cultural heritage richness, um, most manifested here by the Burrup um, Peninsula rock art. It's also a place in which people's experience of water developments have been quite um, difficult and quite contested. This is a comment um, from uh, a, f a very good film in, from 1993 called Exile and the Kingdom, where a, a, an Aboriginal woman is commenting on the creation of the Harding Dam and how it damaged the local environment, it damaged the places that they used to walk and that there was, in a sense, no way that they could do that any longer. We were brought in as the CSIRO because Rio Tinto and, of course, other companies had noted that there was going to be a substantial change in industry water use over the journey. Um, this graph is actually somewhat out of date, but it, the, the pattern is all that really matters here, which is a number of mines were going to go below the water table in a way that was economically viable and begin pumping substantial amounts of water out of, out of the holes in order to, um, to continue operation. 
this was going to substantially change um, some local environments and, and significantly change water use across the Pilbara. This was something that um, a number of people were very um, interested to, to learn more about. And so we were brought in to do a, a review of Indigenous water values in the area. I will cut to the chase here and simply note a comment from a, a very um, respected elder in the area, Cyril Lockyer, about um, the ways in which for them, the responsibility to look after country included consideration of um, significant mythical creatures or uh, significant ancestral creatures. In this case, the rainbow serpent. The rainbow serpent is a recurring um, symbol of um, and representation of Aboriginal spirituality across particularly Northern Australia. And it's a way, it's one of the means through which people um, relate um, themselves to others from quite distant locations. What Sue was emphasising here is the, is the sense of responsibility if, if the, and the, the fact that the snake is implicated in the presence or absence of water. This ties back into um, what I was talking about in the first example of um, Blue Mud Bay, the relationship between ancestry, country and human responsibility. That's large scale development. Um, there are Aboriginal people who are very significant, who are very significantly involved in development in the Pilbara. The last example that I wanted to talk about today um, also has a case study in the Pilbara, but is um, Blue Mud Bay in North Queensland. CSIRO, um, we as a team at CSIRO are undertaking water um, and indigenous development investigations. And in particular, this is development looking at um, native title and indigenous landholder corporations and what their options are. I'll talk a little bit about that now. In these kinds of development processes, Indigenous people are understood to be more than just stakeholders. They have a unique status as, as, as First Nations people and we have a unique set of resources. So in thinking about economic development or indeed social and economic development in the future, this is crucial. They're also, as you've probably seen, balancing long-term, deeply embedded um, uh, responsibilities for the protection of country and culture with the need for, to generate short to medium term economic opportunities. Native title corporations, the, the land owning corporations that are increasing, increasingly the feature of Aboriginal Australia, want to be owners, partners, co-investors in future development. Aboriginal Australians, there's been in a sense a phase shift and an increasing level of demand for this kind of connection or involvement. There are, of course, challenges to regional and remote economic participation, and I won't go into those here, but this is understanding these challenges and addressing them is a crucial part of, of, um, of what we now do here. This land um, under, for native title purposes has actually relatively been recently returned. Um, it's the Native Title Act dates from the early 1990s in Australia. And so there's actually a whole um, a significant number of Aboriginal Australians who've, who've regained control of traditional lands that are now in an altered form. And they really need to understand how, what they can do with those lands and how they can, in a diversified, resilient way that's appropriate to the scale that suits them, individual, family or local corporation, what kinds of opportunities they have. In our conversations about water and development, we know that there are fairly consistent views on, on the ways in which um, water should be used and developed, so that Indigenous people in these regions tend to prioritise smaller scale and off-stream um, water uses, so rather than large in-stream dams and the like, and that there's a strong emphasis on Indigenous benefit from use of these resources. This highlights how um, the research that would be needed to support Indigenous decision makers may be somewhat different from those from, from larger developers, for example, or even from necessarily from government interests. There are significant numbers of people in these areas who want to develop, who need to, and who are seeking opportunities to do so, but they don't necessarily have um, the information at the scale that's appropriate to them to be able to do that. And that's some of the work that we're working on. Um, I, there, in conclusion, I'm mindful of the time, there are recurring patterns and issues for water across um, Northern Indigenous Australia. Um, securing greater public and legal recognition of customer Indigenous governance and ownership of water, and the first example was a real manifestation of that. 
ensuring water to maintain healthy landscapes and, and cultural resources and practices is a, is a key feature. Having access to water sites, I didn't go into it in detail, but in many parts of Australia, the rights and interests of people have got back are not necessarily full ownership of the areas involved. They may only be access rights to um, for particular purposes, and that's an ongoing challenge for people. Further issues are maintaining adequate supplies for, for Aboriginal Australians, in, in, particularly in regional and remote, remote communities. Our discussions about water volumes often slide into um, conversations about water quality and this, the sufficiency of those for community purposes. Issues and aspirations also encompass securing substantial water reserves for current and future economic activity, and this highlights the development interests that I talked about before. People are seeking to understand how their water dependent asset bases, to use sort of economic language, how they can be used sustainably. And, mo and equally importantly, if there are major or even minor water developments going on um, undertaken by non-Indigenous interests, that they, um, that Indigenous Australians um, often emphasise the need to derive benefits from those water uses. Oops, apologies, wrong button. There are challenges created for Aboriginal Australians in engaging with um, settler Australian colonial law and management, particularly, for example, divisions between the land, water and sea. Um, that was the first example um, emphasised that point. There, there is variable ability for people to assert their ownership and management, depending on where they are and what's going on. If there's very substantial mining development, then that changes the, the nature of the conversation. In all those cases, um, time, effort and resources are required to, re to achieve meaningful regional and remote Indigenous participation. I, I haven't gone into detail about process of engagement here, but I'll just note some observations um, from my own experience of, of needing to undertake research in, in a whole range of areas across Northern Australia. But there are shifting demands on research and researchers um, emerging out of changing geography and demography, and that includes the, the large numbers of uh, Indigenous Australian young people, impacts of climate change, the fact that um, substantial numbers of people, as I said, are securing their country back, but it's in a different form from when it was um, held pre-colonially. Those are all circumstances that are required, need to be addressed in an ongoing way. Indigenous people increasingly want to lead research rather than um, simply be a, a participant or a stakeholder in it, and that's an exciting development for all of us. There are ongoing demands in terms of managing Indigenous cultural and intellectual property protections as we as we develop our understanding of both Indigenous Australia and its and its economic needs. I'll add to that also commercial um, property um, protections. In undertaking the kind of work that I do, um, the knowledge of representative processes in bodies, both the formal and informal ones, is absolutely crucial to making sure that um, we are able to get successful results for everyone involved. Um, it's crucial that Aboriginal Australians get the information they need to make the decisions that they need to make. The demand for skills in this area is growing and it's quite clear that there are a, a need, there's a need for um, development pathways for skills on both sides, that skills within non-Indigenous water practitioners, but also Indigenous Australians who will be increasingly taking important roles in water planning, management and policy development, as well as water governance and ownership over the journey. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all of the, the traditional owners who are in the, in the slide so far. This is some of the partners for some recent research um, but I, on, the, on that basis, I'll uh, leave it there and say thank you. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Marcus. It's been a, a terrific um, broad run through of some massive issues here. And the questions have been coming in for, uh, thick and fast. So let's get stuck into these questions. First up, I just noticed from Wendy, thank you for that. You mentioned there's an Aboriginal community organisation, Walwick, New South Wales, on the Barwon and Namoi Rivers, the Great Artesian Basin, recognition, acknowledged. Thanks very much for mm -hmm. making that note. Uh, recognise that, acknowledge that. Okay, the first one up there at the moment, how does Marcus suggest we educate people of these Indigenous practices to improve environmental set settings impacted by agriculture or development? Thanks for the question. I um, really appreciate that. Look, I think the education process, I've reflected on this a little bit because I actually did come out of a university setting before I started working for CSIRO. 
I think it actually, firstly, it starts in schools. I think we need to get a, a much better grounding in, in, the, in the primary and secondary school system about the ways in which Aboriginal Australians and Torres Strait Islander Australians were looking after Australian landscapes, landscapes over an extended period. I think also there's real roles for specific um, content in university courses um, and, and professional practice courses about Indigenous interests, Indigenous management practices and how, how best to understand and engage those in the contemporary context. That's great. Now, thanks for that. Now to Craig's question. Um, Craig Flavel, aside from groundwater's indirect support of water bodies and ecosystems and its direct use for water supply, are there other Aboriginal values placed on groundwater? You'll like that one, I think. <laughs> Again, thanks for the question. And I did gloss over this. Um, one, one of the ways in which Aboriginal people that I've encountered in a range of contexts across Australia understand their connections to one another is actually through um, groundwater sources in different locations potentially being interconnected. And um, they will talk about um, the ancestral beings journeying through those landscapes and coming up at particular points. They'll talk about the, relate, about the similarity and characteristics of groundwater and how that, may manif that, that reflects connections between people. So it's not necessarily, um, it is a really significant um, set of values and it doesn't necessarily mean that that is a scientific statement. It's actually a statement about how the relationships between country reflect the relationships with, between people. Yep. Uh, Marnie Island has asked, what knowledge does Marcus have of the National Cultural Flows Research Project, a methodology developed by Aboriginal people for, Ag for Ab Aboriginal people and intended for use across Australia? Yeah, actually, I was actually reading it um, last week. Um, mm -hmm. We're doing some work for the Indigenous Reference Group for Northern Australia um, on Aboriginal and, and, and Torres Strait Islander water issues for Northern Australia. And we're drawing on the materials generated by the Cultural Flows Research Project. There are parts of Australia where Aboriginal people don't use that term or where the legislation is structured in such a way that it's not as useful as it has been in the Murray-Darling. And so one of the things that working in Northern Australia we need to do, because the Murray-Darling tends to dominate the national conversation because it's so significant, we actually need to work out um, how much things that are applied in the Murray-Darling work or don't work for Northern Aboriginal Australians. And that's, that's a conversation that's ongoing. The cultural flows work's been fantastic. It's just um, we can't roll it out immediately without thinking through what the implications of that are. Another one coming up. Indigenous people are engaged differently across Australia, particularly within urban settings. How do you suggest the Indigenous people become more involved? Thanks very much. Um, look, I, that one is... is uh, partly why I didn't actually go into the detail of engagement practices in this particular webinar. I think that is something that's very much needs to be driven by um, local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander consultation, local Indigenous consultation. The most important thing to do is to ask the question of the traditional owners of the area in about how they um, feel that they should be engaged and to let them set the t set some of the terms of that engagement and that can be quite a long process actually talking about how to talk might yeah. is as significant as trying as trying to deal with the content of water management itself um, I think that's something that requires a lot more discussion but in general terms yeah uh, it's clearly an issue and and particularly for things like water supply yeah, that's right. That's a great answer. And we'll get more to that as we get down further with these questions. Uh, there's a question from Marcus Barber, your namesake. Hi, Marcus. Are there any signs that given ongoing droughts, there will be a re-challenging of Indigenous water rights by, say, mining or pastoral interests? I, that's that's future, future casting in a way I probably wouldn't be able to comment on specifically. What I will say is that the, there's been strong interest from... Um, um, government policy people across the board to try to better recognise Indigenous interests. I think the, the, the pathways for that recognition are different depending on how much demand there is for the water. So in the Murray-Darling, it's been a real challenge to get Aboriginal people to the table um, because of the levels of demand on water resources. In other parts of Australia, for example, in the Northern Territory, they've just created a mechanism for quite substantial reserves of, for Aboriginal water reserves for Aboriginal people. Um, I think in, in mining and development terms, the other question is 
it's increasingly important to bring that particular industry into the water planning regime and that's happened much more consistently across northern Australia in the last um, decade or so. So I think it's a question not so much about mining versus Aboriginal people but about how we set up a structure and a system for managing water across the board and making sure that Aboriginal interests are protected in that process. Emma Coates has asked, uh, so many Australians do not understand the deep and complex cultural natural history of this continent. That is a big foundational issue. As a result, governments don't invest in partnering with Aboriginal people to progress the Aboriginal water aspirations, let alone the critical cross-cultural learning that needs to happen. Support that. When we're getting to the question here. The Victorian government has done better than the other state governments and is committed to self-determination as a guiding principle. Vic government is also doing a lot of work with Aboriginal water uh, space in the Aboriginal water space in partnerships with traditional owners. Probably take that as a comment. Got any yeah. comments to make about that? I, I, look, I, thank you I, again. Um, I was actually looking at some of the Victorian initiatives just yesterday. I think that goes back to my point about the emphasis on education <coughs> and that education happening in the early stage and, and, and being something that all Australians get through the schooling system. I think it's crucial that we establish those foundations and then water becomes a particular manifestation of an understanding that is broader. Yep, yep. Well, well said. Uh, well said, Emma. Thanks for that comment. That's really good. Um, Stephanie Lowe uh, says, "Will it be possible to hear more about the approach for developing a spatial water resource use map that was covered earlier? Maybe in another webinar. That, that's probably that was actually idea. that was a yeah. The the use map was about um, fishing and hunting, <laughs> and the short answer was the methods for that was eighteen months in a tent in remote Arnhem Land, which is not necessarily <laughs> necessarily able to be replicated in every circumstance. But there are um, quite exciting ways in which, um, um, for example, Indigenous ranger groups and so on are, are, are using um, spatial mapping methods to, to get a better handle on the way that resources are used. And I think um, that's a terrific terrain for collaborative projects. And maybe it's a direction we could go in after this webinar, uh, Marcus. We'll, we'll talk more about that as we get through. Nadine Kilsby has asked, what about water interests in urban environments when the catchment is stormwater? Yep. The short answer is I haven't been asked to do work in, the, in that context. And so I would simply say that that's, that's a matter for others. I, I, wouldn't, I would be commenting outside my expertise. Yep. yep. So here's a question which is fair enough. I'm struggling with hearing this information from a non-Indigenous person. Surely we could have heard this information from an eminent Aboriginal water expert. Yeah, look, thanks for that question. I debated whether to deal with that at the start in more detail and decided not to. Um, primarily what, I, what I'm offering here is um, reflections from a non-Indigenous person at scale. So one of the things that is crucial in Aboriginal Australia is that people are talking about um, country that relates to them and or that they have authority to speak about. I'm not in that position except in one particular circumstance in Blue Mud Bay where I've been authorised to do that a little more often. Mm. Um, it's something that comes up repeatedly. The primary role that is important, that the role that I play is in synthesising and supporting um, Aboriginal water interests and in particular assisting non-Indigenous people with some of the ways in which um, they may be able to engage with this material that's a, a, a process that I undertake collaboratively with a whole range of Indigenous Australians. And what you're seeing today is a really concentrated burst of that. So um, it's not necessarily a, a question with a single straightforward answer, but it's something that um, I have feel like is important to... It's, to, it's important that non-Aboriginal Australians are still able to learn and speak about these issues and to share what they've, um, what they've learned themselves. The crucial uh, questions are, what are the authorities around that? What are the processes around that? And is it good science? Is it, is it accurate? Mm -hmm. And that's crucial. Yep. No, that's very good. It might be something for a down uh, post webinar. Yes, uh, type certainly, of, uh, discussion. certainly. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, specific engagement training and so on, absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, yep. that cultural awareness training and all those sorts of things. Yes. Yep, that'd be great. Let us know if you want to progress with that. Uh, the person that asked that question. Uh, Josephine Searle, could you point us in the right direction for any groundwater-related cultural water projects from outside WA? Um, I probably could, but I'd rather do that offline. I'd yep, have to think that. about if it's specific to groundwater. Actually, the, the Roper River example I talked about, that river is largely groundwater-fed. Yep. Um, it, it's probably more the desert 
um, materials and I'm less familiar with those, but we can certainly um, certainly try to address that. Yes, that's good. And, and uh, just mean fire us an email that, and that'll reach Marcus. It'll be great. Uh, John Sweeney says, traditional owner cultural values is a protected beneficial use of water in most states. Do you expect more specific guidelines to be developed in the future with input from traditional owners or are cultural values inherently protected by other values, ecosystem, potable supply, etc.? I think that's a, that's a, that's exactly what I was getting at with the with the, the historical example of the Roper weirs and of how we need to get more sophisticated in in our understanding of how Aboriginal cultural interests are manifested in water management. That that may actually um, it cro or it does cross cut um, some of the categories that that are used within water planning and water management in contemporary terms, and that we are going to need to greater Aboriginal involvement in water governance for that reason. So the short answer to that question, I would say, is yes, we do need those more specific guidelines, and we we need to get more precise. Jade Gould has asked, how do you manage cultural authority? Oftentimes, when engaging government, hears some individuals don't speak for others. How do you know if you are engaging with individuals? with this authority to make decision on behalf of others. And that's actually part of the professional skill, to be honest. Um, it's one of the things that you, it requires a level of experience, uh, understanding, and I actually noted that in one of the last slides, the, the knowledge of the representational processes, both formal and informal in Aboriginal Australia is absolutely crucial. That includes also understanding where there are levels of disagreement. And so that, that, that you may hear um, um, people saying that they can't speak for others and you, or you may hear people saying that they can and then understanding the the authority behind those statements is really important I, all i can say is that it, it's actually part of what 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 is the work of engagement is making sure that you you've you've understood who it is that you ought to be talking to yep no good good to bring that up jade thank you humira blake is is there any research in central desert areas most central desert areas are cattle stations of mining and and Aboriginal people were pushed out. Pretty sure my ancestors had distinctive roles in desert water management. Yeah, the short answer is yes, there is, and I, but I haven't been, um, I've been largely focused on Northern Australia um, and I was presenting today work that was, was something that, I, that work that I was directly engaged with. Uh, Clint Bain asked, what are some of the skill gaps in Indigenous communities needed for water management? How have they been addressed? Uh, Joe, Joe Dorch, sorry, Do Joe Dorch from Rio. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, one of the observations I've made in recent times is that in the the, the uh, represent regional representative structures known as the land councils for those who are outside of Australia, which have often had a role in interfacing between Aboriginal Australians and the rest of Australian society, have predominantly been land councils. They actually haven't had substantial levels of skill um, or resourcing attached to water management interests. And so I think there is one. There is a crucial role there, and as we as we collectively in society get better at managing our water issues and interests, that that the development of Aboriginal skills and knowledge, specifically in relation to how water is, the policy regulation, the management of water, and um, the science of water, the hydrology of water, is managed. That needs to improve. There's a good one here. How are Indigenous values incorporated into Australia's market-based trading mechanisms for water? Are there safeguards in place for specific allocations and are these assigned an explicit economic value? The short answer is that the work that I've undertaken has not been in areas where there were large, where there were market-based trading mechanisms. I think this goes back to the question of what the nature of the protections are that exist. Um, the short answer is the market-based instruments generally don't deal with it very well because they presume a certain way of interacting and they presume tradability. And one of the things about um, Aboriginal Australian water interests is that then they're, they're not necessarily going to move states um, purely on the basis of economic viability. There's a huge, huge connection to country there that plays a role. The establishment of the of the water reserves in um, in the Northern Territory and in Queensland is specifically designed to address the, that issue to make sure that should a water market emerge, that there are pre-existing protections for Aboriginal interests. Mm. It, whether How well they work is a separate question, but that's yeah. precisely what it's getting at. It's a recognition that market-based interests aren't necessarily the best way of protecting or representing those interests. A couple more questions and then we'll call it a day. Sanjay um, has asked, is there a need for a national act that safeguards indi Indigenous values within legislation similar to the Resource Management Act, act of Aotearoa New Zealand? 
there's been some really exciting um, work going on in New Zealand in recent times. This is where actually it's good to understand that Australia is actually the United States of Australia, that primarily um, the, the responsibility for managing water rests with the states and territories. And so there is a relatively limited set of roles that the Commonwealth Government nationally can play in, in encouraging better water management. And one of the ways they do that is actually funding research. So a significant amount of the work that CSIRO does is funded by the Commonwealth Government, but is for the benefits of the states and territories. So the answer to that question is you could, you could do something, but it would need to be very carefully um, constructed and it would probably almost certainly need to have um, buy-in from, the, from the, the state and territory jurisdictions. Joe Lane has asked, have you researched water trading with Indigenous versus consumptive users? Uh, no, is the short answer to that question. Yeah. Not yet. And that's partly because the Northern Australian context, water trading hasn't really um, been required. They're largely unregulated systems and they're under-allocated in most circumstances. Uh, how do we learn and share knowledge from traditional owners to colleagues and friends, but still respect their right to hold uh, intellectual property rights? This is precisely the kind of question I think that's good to deal with um, in a more detailed way through um, more specific training. Yeah. There are free prior and informed consent processes and, and, and cultural and intellectual property protections are crucial. In the case of the work that I presented today, it's all um, been authorised to go public many years ago. So I've spoken about it a number of times and, uh, and followed the processes involved in order to be able to do that. And there are ways in which you protect individual identities, ways in which you de-identify de locations or, or remove the specificity around particular statements to make sure that, in a sense, if it needs to be protected, it can be. Uh, Roger Bateman has asked an unusual one here, but interesting. I understood that Marcus Sands had spent several centuries visiting the Yongu people and fishing along the coast. Also, that they introduced canoe technology. Is this so? Do the Marcus Sands have any rights to claim? It's one of the things I used to use in teaching was to talk to the students about the fact that they needed to realise that when Captain Cook planted the flag in, in 1770 that there were probably thousands of um, uh, not modern day Indonesian fishermen on the northern coast of Australia who'd been coming there for generations and had trading agreements and so on. It changes the nature of Australian history when you take the Yongu engagement with Makassar seriously. They wouldn't necessarily, there's, there's actually a map in somewhere in Sulawesi, I think, that shows Northern Australia as part of the kingdom of Sulawesi. Right. <laughs> Don't quote them, it's, it's, it's like that. Um, so the short answer is we, that's a good part of, that's a good example of how um, a better, better content in our education system can reshape the way that we think about um, coastal rights. And younger people themselves from Blue Mud Bay, where I was talking about, and across the Northern Coast, um, talk about their agreements with Macassan traders and how that indicated their capacity to deal with outsiders and they compare that often usually negatively with the way that European Australians engage with them. Two more questions and we'll leave it at that. So this is it, John Smelt and Steve Bolton. John says, uh, what future do you see for water given the ongoing releases from mining wastewater treatment and urbanisation? Oh, look, I'd probably have to say that's outside of my jurisdiction. I work with about 5,000 other people, some of whom are specialists in those areas. Um, what I can say in terms of the greater degrees of control and of Aborig by Aboriginal interests of water issues and our increasing respect for their, the, for their traditional ownership should give them a greater role in those processes. Yep. Uh, last one, Steve Bolton, do you agree more funding should be available for ranger groups to be trained to capture water monitoring data to quantify traditional knowledge. I'm actually um, working on another project that is a ra precisely focused on diversifying and expanding the funding um, base for ranger groups, Indigenous ranger groups in Australia. The assumption being that the, the government purse um, for, that, for those processes will always be finite and, and uh, Indigenous ranger groups themselves understand that they need to be engaging with a whole set of diverse interests in that process. Um, so the answer to that question is, yes, I do think they, it's a fantastic industry. It's been incredibly successful so far. It, only, it should continue, and it's in the best interest of all Australians that it does. But the ways in which we enable that um, will require more than simply increased government funding. They'll require um, diversification of the industry, shall we say. That's been a fantastic one hour and um, lots of uh, comments here. Thank you for great insights from Anthea. Thanks for your answers. Thanks for so informative, Gemma says. 
and any more comments in the chat line, we'll, I'll send those out to you, Marcus. That's been fantastic. Uh, we appreciate all your questions and discussion today. It's been huge. There's the free webinars, uh, lots of different topics. So we won't go into them right now and online courses further down. So look, thanks everybody for being part of this. Appreciate your comments. Thanks, Olivia. Thanks, Heather. Sanjay, appreciate your comments coming through even now. We're going to call it a day. A wonderful effort, Marcus. It's been Thank full you. on for an hour and appreciate your time in a very busy schedule. Thanks again, Marcus. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Great. Bye. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com. Dot au